Good evening. The National Council on Education for the Ceramic Arts acknowledges that its 2023 conference takes place on unseceded and stolen territories of the Hopewell, Adena, Miami, Shawnee, Osage peoples who were forcibly removed from their land. These and other indigenous peoples have faced discrimination and violence in Ohio and throughout the Americas. We further acknowledge that the socioeconomic, institutional, physical, psychological, and emotional wounds and inequities that endure as a result of these reprehensible systems and policies, as well as inhumane actions. Intika honors indigenous communities, past, present, and emerging, here and around the world. We wish to pay respect to local elders, including those of lands from which you may be joining us remotely. As an organization made up of dedicated people to creativity, teaching, and learning, NSICA acknowledges that transparency and education can shift practices to build a more inclusive, equitable, and respectful society that respects all cultures. Caitlin Curtis, a member of the Potawatomi tribe, offers that to connect, to be present with the earth, and to be part of healing, we can do so by researching the history of colonialization, by studying documents like the Doctrine of Discovery, going on walks, looking out a window, watching birds, because any way of connection is connection and is part of the healing. She encourages us to talk to our houseplants because these are the beings that take care of us every day, bringing us joy, cleaning the air, and talking to the plants, trees, and life around us begins to shift the way we think and examine our relationship to other beings. Micro shifts in our everyday small moments to change the way we think and process our world and macro shifts to change the systems that affect us all. From her most recent book, Living in Resistance, an indigenous vision for seeking wholeness every day, she says, reciprocity is resistance. Mindfulness is resistance. Paying attention to the land is resistance and it leads us into deeper relationships with all things and all beings. I now want to invite Mapo to the stage. I wanna say greetings and welcome uh, to our INSICA conference, the 2023 Cincinnati celebration. Um, give yourself a hand for being here. I'm going to begin by introducing Aftab Provel, who is the 70th mayor of Cincinnati. He was raised in Southwest Ohio, the son of first generation Americans, and he's making history as Cincinnati's first Asian mayor. As mayor, he is committed to serving Cincinnati's 52 neighborhoods, and he has made equitable economic growth the top priority of his administration, as well as comprehensive reform and improvements of public safety, affordable housing, and, and environmental action. That is one of the most important. He served as Hamilton County Clerk of Courts from 2016 to 2021, and was the first Democrat to do so in over 100 years. During his tenure, he brought modern and professional reforms to the clerk's office. He paid a living wage to all the employees and became the first uh, in the county as that officer in Ohio to offer a comprehensive paid family leave. By ending nepotism, cutting waste, and by making the office more professional, he saved taxpayers millions of dollars. Mir Aftab is a graduate of Ohio State University, my graduate alma mater, thank you very much. <laughs> and, he, um, and he graduated from the University of Cincinnati in law school. 
He resides in Clifton with his wife, Whitney, and his, sons, Bo and his son, Bodhi and Rami. Please welcome Mayor Aftab. What's up, Ensika? How we doing? Yes, let's go. I heard you ceramics people were crazy. Let's go. Let's start it off. How are we doing it tonight? My name, as was mentioned, is Aftab Pureval. I'm the mayor of the great city of Cincinnati, and it is such a treat to welcome you to our town. I'm honestly amazed to see how many members you have here in the Queen City. You are killing it. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. It says here, pause for uh, uproarious laughter that may have been ambitious. But listen, it's true. It's a true honor for Cincinnati to host the National Board to welcome and Sika for the first time since 1990 and to be a venue for four days of exciting, thought-provoking conversations about the ceramic arts. We talk a lot here and in cities like ours throughout the nation about how we can better foster vibrant, cohesive, proud communities, how we can encourage our children to seek their passions, to be curious, and to forge a path to give back to their city. And there is no replacing the importance of the arts in that mission. In our city, we are so fortunate to have diverse, talented, young, uh, and experienced artists and creators who inspire new conversations every day throughout our neighborhoods and who help create a sense of identity for our residents who look up to them. And it's incumbent upon all of us to recognize their contribution and do what we can to support their work. The National Council on Education for the Ceramic Arts is a treasured partner in that vision. And on behalf of Cincinnati, I just want to say how grateful I am for all of you the creators and organizers who turn ideas into reality. I hope this weekend is fun and engaging and that you all come away with new connections and new thoughts. And on top of that, I hope you have some time to get out and see our beautiful city and everything that our community has to offer. Now, I am thrilled to bring up my friends Cal Cullen and Pam Kravitz, the conference's co-liaisons, to accept a proclamation from my office. Pam, thanks for dressing discreetly tonight. I really appreciate that. I thought I was really taking a chance on this turtleneck, but then I got, I got lapped there. Okay, so from my office, be it proclaimed, whereas Cincinnati has a long history as a national leader in the ceramic arts, enriching our vibrant community, whereas this, this week, Cincinnati will be hosting visitors from throughout the United States as part of the NSICA annual conference, whereas the people of Cincinnati are invited to join in the celebration and advancement of humankind's most enduring art form through numerous exhibitions and educational opportunities throughout the city. Whereas we will be celebrating and elevating Cincinnati ceramic artists, studios, and workspaces, highlighting and advancing their creativity, imagination, and craftsmanship, as well as from visiting art artists around the country. Whereas the city of Cincinnati welcomes Ensika, its members and visitors to explore and enjoy all that our great city has to offer. Now, therefore, I, Aftab Pureval, mayor of the city of Cincinnati, do hereby proclaim March 15th, 2023, as Ceramic Arts Day in Cincinnati. Congratulations. <laughs> My goodness, thank you so much, Mayor Aftab. <laughs> so amazing. <laughs> um, I'm Cal Cullen. I am one of the Cincinnati on-site co-liaisons. And I'm Pam Kravitz. I'm the other half of this amazing team of co-liaisons for the city of Cincinnati, NSICA 2023 current. Cal. They're here. 
You are here. You all came. We are so enamored, so in love. You're my heroes. Uh, I was a ceramic kid. Still am. Um, some of my heroes are here. I love the emerging artists. It's just like the community. It's just brilliant and beautiful. And we are just so incredibly gracious, uh, overly gracious. Over. Gratitude. What is the word? I don't even know. <laughs> but we love you being here. So I get to welcome you to Cincinnati, Ohio, where pigs fly. Have you noticed it? <laughs> <laughs> where we eat our chili on spaghetti. All right, who's had it? Raise your hand. Oh, you can't leave. Oh, no, 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 no. You cannot leave. Oh, thank you. Thank you in the back. I appreciate that. <laughs> and where we say please instead of excuse me, and we have that Midwestern warmth. And I hope through your time here in Cincinnati, you've experienced that. And if you haven't yet, I know you will. We are all so excited that you are all here with us in Cincinnati, celebrating ceramics, celebrating arts, celebrating each other, and just being part of our incredibly vibrant city. And thank you so much for being here. And <laughs> thanks. <laughs> and speaking of Cincinnati, Cincinnati showed up. They showed up. Oh my gosh. Y'all showed up. The city <laughs> showed up. This would not be possible with all, all the venues, the artists, the volunteers, the community people, the hotels, the bars, the storefronts. I could go on and on about all the people that are involved in Cincinnati making this happen. Um, there are two new ways to experience Inseca this year that I want to point out. Um, one is called Windows of Inseca, so people that maybe even don't, <laughs> yes, people that don't even go into galleries are going to experience ceramics because they are all over the storefronts throughout our city. So keep an eye out for those. There's also um, Craft, craft Fair, fair craft which fair. is our bars and restaurants. <laughs> You'll be able to go into a restaurant, get a drink of your choice, and get it in a handmade mug. Uh, courtesy of local potters of Cincinnati. I love that. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing better yeah. than eating off so of cool. drinking off a handmade <laughs> piece of art. It's so yummy. So, Pam, I see you yeah. have like a whole binder here. I, and um, I, know. I, I, know. I, you know, what, what's that about? Cal, I'm overwhelmed. <laughs> I'm overwhelmed. Is anyone else overwhelmed? <laughs> I mean, my spreadsheets have spreadsheets. And I, you know, it's like, I don't know. Do I go to an opening? Do I do, go to a gallery? Do I go to a workshop? Do I go to a lecture? Do I just hang out and eat in the, break, the amazing Pam. food? I know, I know. Pam, I, Pam, what? Pam. what? What? There, we have an answer. Oh, there is a map. <laughs> Use your map. So <laughs> in your bag, there is a map. There's tell, a map. Tell them all about it. This is so nice. It's just, it's handheld. We've been doing a really, we've done our due diligence, I want you to know, um, to honor sustainability <laughs> and really acknowledge the fact that there is so much waste and things that happen like this. But I know, I love you. All right, <laughs> we'll talk later. Um, I don't know if you know, but we've worked with um, So Valley, a fashion incubator in town, to make um, our bags, some of the bags that are made out of dead stock that we're keeping out of landfills. We have hired um, an in-town printmaker to do the t-shirts. We really wanted, and Cal and I really, our North Star has always been our city. Uh, we want you all to come here and we want you to experience the beauty of the artistry of what our city has to offer. And we want you to walk away in knowing that we have done everything we can to make your experience so incredible. Do I have all the answers? I do not. <laughs> I am up every night. My husband has made me Excel spreadsheets and I have a binder and I have a daily thing. But I'm going to tell you this. We have had the privilege and pleasure of seeing so many of the works so far, and they are brilliant. Mm -hmm. Everything is brilliant. You all brought your A-game times 10. So no matter what you choose, no matter where you go, leave knowing that your heart is full and you have seen things and learned things and done things that you've not done before. So you cannot leave going like, oh my gosh, I missed that, I missed that. Mm -hmm. Don't worry. Everything you see, every workshop you go to, every lecture is going to be amazing because you all are amazing. <laughs> and, and on that note, I just want to give a huge thank you and shout out to all the Inseca staff, to the board, 
this all, I mean, for taking a chance on us, this all totally. would not be possible without yeah. the amazing Nsika team. So I just want to say thank you for I believing in us. <laughs> so I'm kind of a little like a social media stalker. <laughs> I like to see what's going on, and I noticed in the Ensika and the Clay Buddies websites, fa uh, Facebook, y'all are in search for a very special little creature. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? It's not the beautiful clay pieces here, which there are so many, and I know you're going to go home with some, but this is the elusive Lego Potter. <laughs> yeah, I know, it's hard to find. You have to go to the Lego store and feel around. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Y'all know what I'm talking about. I know you know, because I follow y'all. You have to go feel for the headpiece that feels like a shell. So it feels like, oh, I, what are y'all doing? How do you know? Yes, exactly. Look under your chair. We found 10 in the package. Lego potters, minifigs, that are incredibly hard to get a hold of. But we got you. Well, we got 10 of you. <laughs> Who's got one? Who found one? <laughs> Raise your hand. Oh my God, it's like the golden ticket, right? You got the golden ticket. But there's no chocolate at the end of that. Just a cool little Lego figure. Well. That's it. We're ready for That's our it. keynote. Um, yeah. Be sure to stick around for the Randall session after. We have something very special planned. Oh, please stay for the Randall session. And don't forget the dance party on Friday night and everything in between. Oh, my and gosh. Here okay, is our the fearless leader. Incredible Rhonda <laughs> Willers. <laughs> I love them so much. I hope you all got to see a slice of what we've had with them in the last couple years of this planning process. Um, well, welcome everyone. I am here to um, welcome you to Nsika on behalf of the Nsika Board of Directors. I'm currently serving as the president, and I want to play a little bit of an interactive thing with you tonight, just for a few minutes, if you will, because I want to celebrate you being here. So. We're gonna, I want you to think about, for just a quick minute, some math. How many Nsika conferences have you been to? So just kind of get the number ready in your head, okay? I actually don't know my own number, so I would not be good at this game, but we'll just, you know, wing it, wing it, wing it. Okay, so if you've been here for over 20 Nsika conferences, I want you to clap right now. If you've been, I mean, amazing, right? If you've been here between 15 and 20 conferences, give me a clap, or 15 and 19, okay. And then what about between five and 10? Can we get some claps? And then we've got the maybe two to fives. How about two to fives? Okay, whose first conference is it? And now, together, let's clap to celebrate our collective time here. And welcome to our new attendees. We're so glad you're here. I just want to take a moment to show you the names of the Nsika Board of Directors who have worked um, as volunteers over these multiple years to plan this event. And without their leadership, um, a lot of things wouldn't change in the way that you see them. And their thoughtfulness is one of the things that I cherish and value so much about working together. We also want to take a moment to show you the names of the Nsika staff. The Nsika staff works so hard. Many of you know them through their emails and you're seeing them in person. You're like, you're that person. And what a joy it is for all of us and for all of them to see you in person too. After learning about you through your words, through your writing, through your proposals. We are so grateful for our staff and for our board and mostly for all of you being here. So thank you. Tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce Nsika's executive director, Josh Green.
So I have to say that it's really awe-inspiring to be here before all of you tonight, especially after the past three years, and just amazing that we get to share this time and this space together. It's also equally humbling to those of us uh, who may be joining us remotely via live stream or afterwards through the recording, and also to represent a deeply dedicated board and staff and that Rhonda just introduced, but most of all to introduce our keynote speaker. Rose B. Simpson is part of a matrilineal, uh, multi-generational lineage of artists working with clay. Her expanded practice ranges from ceramics to sculpture to metalwork, to performance, installation, writing, and even automobile design. She received an MFA in ceramics from the Rhode Island School of Design in 2011, as well as an MFA in creative nonfiction from the Institute of American Indian Arts in 2018. She lives and works from her home at Santa uh, Clara Pueblo and hopes to teach her young daughter how to creatively engage the world. An artist and thinker whose work evolves out of the human need to form connection and the experience of space as a source of that connection, Simpson's voice and vision resonate with what motivates many of us to be here together this evening. Space is not distance. It's not a journey to a horizon. It's here where we are in this very room. It's a never-ending never experience of now, as well as a connection to our deep ancestral roots. And whether we're connected to one another, looking outwardly through space, or looking inwardly in moments of inner focus and meditation, space is a source of connection. I think in clay, says Rose Simpson, it was the earth that grew our food, the house we lived in, the pottery we ate out of and prayed with. So my relationship to clay is ancestral, and I think it has a deep genetic memory. It's like a family member for me. Please join together in this space and give a warm welcome to Rose B. Simpson. I'm just going to take a moment and just be with my, my nervousness. My heart is beating really hard. It's really nuts to be in this space right now. Um, but I'm honored and I'm grateful that Nsika, um invited me to be here to share with you all. Um, mm. Um, I'd like to take a moment and acknowledge all the ancestors, the people who once lived here, on this, um, and, and that this land was their ancestral place, and then all the people who have built entire stories in this place, and we're all guests. Um, not all of us are guests, but <clears throat> I think we often forget to act like guests wherever we go. And so I am a guest here in Nsika in Cincinnati, and I uh, get to practice being a guest, and I get to practice being respectful and conscious and um, considerate um, as best I can. And I hope you all join me with that. So um, I titled this Sourced Inspiration, Innovation, and Material. And I think often about being a ceramic artist, and, I, and people ask me, why clay? And I always return to clay because it is my, my root um, material, I think, in lots of ways. But I think um, my material is also spirit. My material is thought. My material is experience. My material is challenge. My material is um, this journey called life and the relationships that we're in on this life. Um, so let's begin. <laughs> There's lots of um, screens I don't know which one to look at. 
<clears throat> I like this photo. Let me, let me start and tell you a little bit about the way that I built this slideshow because I usually talk about my work in a linear manner. Um, where I talk about my growth and my challenges and what I've learned. And in this one, I wanted to talk about certain ideas separately. Um, and all of it is about building myself and witnessing myself and learning about myself in new ways. Um, I often think that any time that I get to an answer, that I need to ask a new question. If I get too comfortable with something, then I need to ask a new question. I like this photo that Manesh Bakrania took of me because I'm building myself and it's that deep introspection that the clay offers me to learn about myself. So one of the ideas to me of source is root. And as a very wild and sometimes very ungrounded person, root is very important to me to remember every day how to um, ground myself, how to remember my history, my foundation, and my context, and to find ways to honor that which came before me and to remember my place in this line and this journey, right? And how do we go back and remember um, where we come from so that we can move forward more consciously? This is one of my favorite pots ever, <laughs> right? We all have a favorite pot probably in here. <laughs> Um, and this is um, an ancestral Puebloan vessel from um, uh, central to southwestern New Mexico. Um, <clears throat> and this to me, this, this vessel speaks to me about how I see the world or I was taught to see the world in pattern. And the vessel itself is, um, it's not separate from life, it shows um, the way that we in interact and interpret the world, the way that we honor our existence, the way that we, um, we are those vessels. We are that vessel in relationship to all things. And that vessel represents wind and mountains. It represents the directions. It represents the journey we're on. It represents the world. It represents um, all the things that, that we need to remember and hold important. Um, and it's in this very simple and beautiful vessel. Um, and so I think that, I think of things in pattern. And so when I approach my process and my, and my studio process or even the process of life and being a human being, I think about pattern. Um, <clears throat> this is a drawing I did um, for Chaco Canyon National Historic Monument. They were doing, um, I think it was like an astronomy festival. They asked me to draw their poster. <laughs> and so I had taken this photograph on the, uh, on the left of uh, Aztec Ruins National Monument. There's a blue line in this wall. There's a blue line of rocks in this wall. And it was an initially plastered over. So why did they put that blue line in that wall? It was an intention, it was, a, it was something that was there, and even though it was hidden, there was, a, there was an invested um, belief in it. There was a story that was told in that line of blue rocks, even though you didn't see it. And in the image on the right, you have that same um, cut piece of tree, that wood, the rings of it, the layers of life. You have the, the, the cosmology, the spinning of the planets, you have, um, Mm, comets and fields and the layers of the stones in the building and then the doors going deeper and deeper and deeper within. We also have the sun daggers that mark the time of year and remind us that we're uh, dependent on all things working uh, harmoniously and being aware of that. Mm. And me drawing it is a reminder to myself, right? As much as I am, um, sitting down to honor that which I was taught and that which I feel I need to remember. I also work to remind myself of what I need to um, value, especially in a world that doesn't have a lot of those values. So um, I'm from Santa Clara Pueblo in northern New Mexico. It's halfway between Santa Fe and Taos along the Rio Grande River next to Española, New Mexico, which is the lowrider capital of the world. Um, <laughs> and. Um, um, this photo on the left is, is kind of um, from 1910, is what you might see at Santa Clara back in the day. 
Um, and, and to this day, a lot of people in our Pueblo make and sell their pottery to support themselves. Um, and I, you know, when I was a kid uh, at the Santa Clara Day School, I remember one of the kids in my class, her mom was the manager at Sonic. And I thought everybody's mom made clay, right? And did clay, and everybody's mom sat at the kitchen counter and sanded their pots or whatever, right? And I was shocked that that wasn't the case for everyone. Um, and I didn't realize um, what a privilege that neural pathway was until later. Um, when I went to RISD, Rhode Island School of Design in um, Providence, and I started realizing that, that not everybody has that privilege of the support system around clay can be your world. And that was something that was given to me. I recently did the math and it's about 70 generations through my matrilineal line where that is um, considered um, a relationship that we honor and we maintain and we continue. The piece that, I, that is here in this slide on the right is actually a, a clay tile piece that I did with uh, on, um, slips and then scratched it back. And then the pot on top is, has a clear glaze on it for all you clay people. <laughs> and then it's on a piece of plywood that I plastered with mud. And it's, in, um, it's a part of an installation that, that's at the Portland Museum of Art called um, To Be Pueblo. And I was trying to look at the stereotype and also deconstruct it and find what was behind that. What if it's a flavor? What if it's a smell? What if it's a way of seeing or being that is beyond objectification, that is beyond the stereotype that we like to put things into to make them easy to digest? <clears throat> You will all get to hear from my mother on Saturday, which is pretty cool. Um, my mother is Roxanne Swenzel, and she was um, uh, an amazing person in that she um, couldn't speak very well when she was a kid, and she'll tell you more about it, but she was able to express her emotions with her clay. And her mom had clay, and her grandma had clay, and everyone in her family had clay, so it was something that she could grab and then um, use to express herself. And so as a little kid, I watched her make these figures. I don't even remember the first time I watched her sit in her studio and make little coils and turn them into people. And when you watch that and watch that and watch that and watch that, and it becomes everything um, that's another neural pathway that, that is um, embedded in my system, right? That, that comes supernatural to me. Um, but she was also really brave um, in that she used contemporary clay um, and, and she experimented with different processes in order to get her um, voice across more clearly. And she gave me a sense of courage to experiment and to, um, to explore in ways that uh, I may not have otherwise Right. So um, speaking of um, exploring, <laughs> I think often about authority um, and how we be careful with what we do and we be careful about what we say and we be careful uh, about how we represent ourselves, right? I come from a community that is, um, <clears throat> has navigated a lot of post-colonial stress disorder and has figured out how to maintain our ceremonies and traditions by being um, careful with what we put out there in the world. And because of that, I've been really conscious and, and sort of sensitive to when we perpetuate stereotypes, right? So it, it made me really aware of how stereotypes can be really painful and um, actually um, abusive, right, to people in a community. And so as someone who is expressing my experience and moving out into the world and being an artist and a creator, um, I often think about what I'm doing and how that will affect my community. And I know that uh, sometimes I see artists and really experimental and doing lots of things and I think, oh, I wish I could do whatever I wanted. <laughs> um, but I think that the blessing, that there's an incredible blessing around accountability. And that has been something where I stop and I think about how my actions will affect my entire community and how I need to be more careful in that way. Um, and also I think about how, what is truth, right? And if we're, if we're representing people, 
you know, um, what is that? To, what, what do you say to represent a bunch of people, right? And I go, I kept telling myself, I don't want to represent my tribe. I don't want to represent Native people in general because any kind of generalization is, is destructive, right? And so what can I do but tell my own truth really clearly? So what is my truth? Who am I? What does that look like? And so I started digging deeper and deeper and deeper into how I can create the parameters to um, experiment with that specific process. Um, and when I was at RISD, I started a process, I experimented with a process where I threw the clay very thin and I worked with it that way. And it forced me to not, I couldn't go back and fix it. I couldn't go back and make it acceptable. I couldn't go back and make it look like my drawing because it didn't, I had to watch it become itself. And in that, I had to release all my fears of what I might be seen as, or it might be ugly, it might be unacceptable, all those things, and, um, and watch it become and accept it um, as it became. And in that, I could accept myself more as my journey, as somebody who's um, always transforming and always uh, in the process of becoming rather than someone who's stuck in an idea or stereotype or an objectification. Um, yeah, so a lot of my work is um, I experiment with materials. I've used different materials because it's helped me learn about myself. So the piece on the left is called X-ray, <laughs> and I cut the metal so that it had the sort of the bones of what I felt like, what I was feeling inside, and what that looks like. Um, on the right, you see, uh, for a while there, I was really lashing a lot of pieces. I found rusty metal, and, I, and when I was in the studio, if there was any, ever any extra clay, I would turn it into a bead or a rod or something I would fire. And then afterwards, I had these drawers full of things I could lash together and tie to my pieces so that they were protected, so that they felt more powerful. Um, and I called these power objects like things that you carry to keep you safe when you enter into spaces that you're scared. Um, and my work is going out there to do a job. It has work to do and I wanna keep it safe. And so I think often about how to do that. Um, but recently, I've started to drop those things and I've started to put necklaces on my pieces because even though they're rough and raw and exhibiting the process and the different clays that I experimented to put together and maybe it cracked, maybe it didn't, and if it didn't, that was a good day. <laughs> and if it did, that was also the truth of where I was. Um, but when I wrapped the necklaces around it, it had a sense of self-worth, had a sense of pride. It was standing there um, in its process, in its vulnerability, in its rawness, and it was still proud. It was still holding itself with reverence and self-respect. And I think I'm working to transfer my system from a warrior who is in a state of fight or flight or always in fear to someone who is standing in their power um, with a sense of self-reverence, which, which has been a journey. Um, so here you can see on the right um, one of my pieces that, were, that I made. That's actually a, a group of pieces I made for the Denver Art Museum. I was doing a residency there. And I started putting all these pieces of um, power objects and adornment and ways to protect oneself. And then on the left, it's sort of simply, it's being more simple. That process is being more simple in how I can represent um, that state of empowerment. And it comes from an experience of being, uh, of feeling like a victim or feeling uh, disempowered or, or having um, experiences that are incredibly challenging and feeling like the world is a fearful place. Um, and one of those have been being a woman and being seen as female. Um, so in Indian country, I don't know if you've heard of this, but there's an epidemic. It's this horrible thing that's happening where, where indigenous women and girls are going missing. So there's missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. And um, a little girl from my tribe went missing while I was working on these pieces. And they were looking for her all over the place and they found her body uh, 
less than a mile from my studio in the river, by the side of the river. And I couldn't stop crying, couldn't stop crying. And I realized that she was me and I was her. And she represented all those women, all those girls for hundreds of years that have been, their bodies have been dumped in this river, in the Rio Grande. And so I started making these pieces. Their arms have these thrown um, cylinders where I painted this black stripe and I scratched a line through it and there's a little golden dot and the golden dot is working its way through that darkness and we're all working through that. Um, and so they have these arms, they have these necklaces of we can get through this and they're empowered in a different way. And so before I took them to the gallery, I took them to the river and I put them in the river um, downstream from where that girl was found. Um, and I keep thinking about um, gender and I keep thinking about my expression of, of empowerment and how I have, uh, I guess, danced around what my truth really is because I've been scared, because I've been um, um, worried for my life in lots of ways. And I think that there have been um, ways that I've addressed some of these fears and some of these inherited traumas. And through my work, I could figure out how to find empowerment through this. So the pieces on the left are the remembering. Recently, they started digging up uh, the graves of children from all the boarding schools um, that were, the, the children that were taken during the um, um, boarding school era they were torn from their families and taken to schools, and then they would die there. They were sometimes tortured and uh, got sick, and their hearts broke, and they died there. And, and they, you know, it went, it disappeared. That truth, those facts are gone. They didn't want to talk about it, right? Um, I went to an Indian boarding school, <laughs> and we used to sneak down in the bottom of the basement, and there was these little cages like the size of like dog houses that they would put the kids in. And the, the, the awareness, you'd see the little names scratched into the wood. Now, those are my, those are my family, right? And there I was con going to the same school, but it was this heritage, this legacy that was hard, but it was very real. And when they started finding these, these children's graves all over Canada and the United States, um, I decided I would make these three kids and put them together, and they could be back together, and they could, they could um, have each other now forever. Piece on the right is uh, is about how I felt like I got I got hardened by um, sort of the smattering of colonialism and what that actually looks like to um, embody. Um, this is a series I did for Savannah College of Art and Design, where I made four eight foot tall figures, and they're they're standing on these little uh, metal points, and they're leaning against the glass. And I said, can I make them lean against the glass? And I was, sure. I was like, sweet. <laughs> um, and there's um, the glass was configured so I could make a star pattern. So the, the, what looks like a plus sign in the stars, I tinted the four ends of it so that the center was clear and the sides were, were tinted. And then I had these large steel plates cut with the star and then um, a vinyl put on the window. And the idea is that the sun would hit and the shadow would try and find its right place. And we're waiting for right place. We're waiting for it to find its way through. We're waiting for that direction to, um, to find its way, right? Um, and there's this tension and clay is so fragile. And I made these during the pandemic and I didn't have any help. <laughs> That was really scary, <laughs> and but the whole experience of making these was so tense, and then leaning, then leaning them against the glass, and something so fragile. And this, uh, this piece is called Countdown. Here's it at night. You can sort of see the tint better. And that they um, <clears throat> are now at Mass Mocha, um, and there are three of them leaning together. They're putting their heads together, which is another metaphor I felt was really strong where there, there's, there's the tenuousness of coming together and the sensitivity of sharing breath and thought and um, uh, community, what community looks like. And uh, we'll talk about the car in a little bit. 
right now, actually. <laughs> um, when I was at um, RISD, I studied performance art a lot. Um, and I was also really fascinated in, in uh, relational aesthetics and aesthetics of the everyday because I was trying to explain what I understood as indigenous aesthetics. There was something I was coming with that I was trying to explain and was really hard to explain. <laughs> and the closest thing I could find was relational aesthetics. I had a teacher, a wonderful teacher named Yuriko Saito, wrote a book called Aesthetics of the Everyday. And we talked about Japanese aesthetics and how, um, where it's applied to everything you do. And that made sense. I was like, yes, that's what I know, right? So it's not like something over there. It's what you do. And that, and it, that in itself is the piece. That is in itself is how you move through the world. And how you move through the world is the art piece. And so you be more conscious about how you walk. You be more conscious about how you cook. You be more conscious about how you treat your food. You be more conscious about how you treat each other, not just people, but plants and animals and, and all the beings that exist in this and other dimensions. And so this idea of performance being something you do for somebody else, right? And it's this, this moment that, that exists and doesn't exist down the road. But I kept thinking, no, it actually changes the participant. So it transforms that person forever. Um, and so uh, how do we become that art piece, right? And how do we just call it what it is, actually? Um, so um, I come from uh, northern New Mexico. And if you know, um, some of our ancestral pottery styles um, are, are black on black wear. Um, specifically, San Ildefonso Pueblo, which is a tribe directly south of ours. Um, and Maria Martinez, is, uh, uh, who <laughs> is known for starting that style. Um, and then I have this piece by Margaret Tafoya, I called her Ko'ohung, on the right. And that's more of a Santa Clara style where we do deep incision. Um, and so Santa Clara traditional pottery is more, um, I guess, brutalist. <laughs> I like that it's really serious, it's dark. This is, the carbon reduction is, is very um, grounded. It's really serious. It doesn't doesn't F around. <laughs> um, so I got this, um, when I came back from RISD, I decided I was going to go to school for automotive science and auto body, because, <laughs> right, obviously. I was studying relational aesthetics and aesthetics of the everyday, and I come from the lowrider capital of the world, and cars aren't refrigerators at home. They're an aesthetic experience, right? So after graduate school, of course, I went to school for auto body which in my town is not just collision repair, it's actually like lowrider school. Um, and so I had a 68 Buick Skylark, and it's a Buick, and if you know about Buicks, you can't get Buick parts. So I found this Chevy, and it had a Chevy drivetrain, but like the body was all beat up, so I was like, I'll take out the Chevy drivetrain and put it in the Buick, and then I'll flip the body for a lowrider. So then I was like, well, I'll pull out all the dents, and then I'll sell it, and then I'll pull out the dents, and I'll sell it, and I started cruising it around, and it was a 1985 Chevy El Camino. And then one day, my mom, that's my mom again, she said, let's take that ugly thing out and um, harvest the, the field. Because we had little kids, and little kids couldn't fit, and that's my other shop truck, that, that 85 Ford F-150. And um, so we took it out in the field, and we put our, our um, let's see, we have watermelons, and corn, and cotton, and beans. And um, I had an aha moment, right? was this moment where I grew up in the lowrider capital of the world, but I'm also a Pueblo person, right? So naturally, it needs to be a traditional pot because it was a vessel. It was a nurturing thing. Even the shape of the bed was like, you know, everybody's, oh, you should turn that into a swimming pool. And I'm like, no, it's a pot. <laughs> we live in the desert. We don't have swimming pools. Pueblo people don't put our head under the water. Right, Virgil? I'm <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> So um, I actually, I was trying to figure out how to do the black on black on this car. And for those of you who paint cars, um, you'll know that you can't really throw a gloss over a satin. But I took a, a hot rod black and I painted the whole thing hot rod black, which is a satin black. And then I, I taped it off and then I threw a gloss clear over it and then pulled the tape off. My teacher was standing there. He's all, you're going to be sanding that car for like two weeks, bro. <laughs> 
And I was like, well, I, you know, if I mess it up, then I'll send the car for two weeks. It's not like I haven't been sanding it for a year, you know? <laughs> and when I pulled the tape off, I screamed, I squealed. <laughs> and because um, it worked, you know? I don't recommend it, it's really hard to wash, but it sure is fun. <laughs> because you can't put wax and then, you know what I mean? It's like a whole thing. But, um, so I put a, a 410 horsepower 350 and a drag race transmission, of course, right? Because I was in a space where I wanted to be fast and loud and feel really powerful, right? And so um, it's more of a street rod than a low rider. And the idea is that she's loud and she takes up space. So what I've been doing with this car is I, um, I get a, a bunch of uh, generally gender, queer, indigenous, uh, post-apocalyptic people and we dress up, take up, you know, just walk down the road in the car. I used to have um, subwoofers. There's a space behind the seat where you would put a spare tire and I filled it with subwoofers naturally, right? And it, so then I would drive it and the car's like bah, 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 bah. and then the speaker's like boo, 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 boo. I put a like a heartbeat in there and just take up space and then we would just be walking up the street, right? And it was a transformative experience, probably for us and other people too, right? But I wasn't doing it for anyone else, I was doing it for us because it was, felt really incredible to do that and experience it. Um, and so we're still talking about authority, I think, right? <laughs> and so I've been thinking about um, how we take uh, authority away from what we call the inanimate, right? My grandma used to talk to her clay. She used to get mad at the grasshoppers too and she'd yell at them and tell them to go tell her, their family not to, to eat the, her plants. <laughs> but I think one of the main problems that I have noticed with our modern culture, I'm not even gonna call it anything specific, it's our modern culture, is that we objectify everything and everything becomes um, a natural resource that we can just take and take and use, right? And so um, in collaboration with the trustees from the field farm um, at, uh, in Boston, um, I proposed a piece where I made these large figures that stood in nature specifically um, these are cast concrete, but they have holes all the way through the head. And the idea is that they're watching. The whole idea is they're just watching. They're out there watching on behalf of what we think isn't watching us. And it is just a simple thing that shows that they're uh, aware of you. And how do you act when something's aware of you that you don't see? Or you forgot you were being watched. And you might act more like a guest, right? We might start thinking about how we move through the world a little better. So um, there's a picture of me and my kid, just for scale. <laughs> but we also made hundreds of beads. And so going back to that, like, that sense of self and, and empowered state, I put those beads on them. Um, and so this is them in the field um, watching. And there's 12 of them. And they're, they're in stillness. And they're witnessing. And they're witnessing. And they're witnessing. And there was something about the colors that I chose that are very clay colors, because those are my favorite colors. <laughs> and I realized that when they're out in the green of Williamstown, Massachusetts, um, that they, um, they don't get lost in the arroyos or what looks like New Mexico, right? That there's something about the, the contrast that's beautiful. I also got to, um, got to work with um, the Mohican community that were uh, from there originally and got uh, relocated. And so we're, we're still working on a project that we'll do with this work um, um, to honor that they get to use the clay from that area to make beads and for themselves um, after they've been uh, relocated and their, their relationship to their ancestral homelands has been severed forcibly. So I think often about also um, inception, right? So what is an artist but a creator? 
And it's so cool when you get to make something that you're that much closer to the awareness of, of how this world comes to be, right? And that, in that moment of making something, you're like, whoa, I could think something and it can be, it can become. And so you might want to be a little more careful about, I'm a, I've been thinking about, I need to be more careful about what I think, right? Because it, it, it comes true as an artist, I get that direct reflection of what that means. So um, I've been thinking about future, present, the awareness of, of um, again, accountability and responsibility for our role in the making of this world. Uh, manifestation, how we be aware of our thoughts and the way we move through the world so that what comes is, is more clear and um, we have more agency in that. And then, and then how do we practice envisioning something beyond our, uh, what we're, we've been taught to think? Um, so this um, photo on the right is actually, I wandered into my mom's yard and she was making pots. I didn't make those pots. She had these pots, she was standing there on the ground and I was like, wow, they're breathing. <laughs> and I took this picture because I really, really love the way they, that they have these mouths and they're in relationship with each other and they're breathing. And I use this to talk about why I leave my vessels empty and the eyes empty because they're full of intention and that intention is watching. And let's go back to that, which we, where we, let, we make the inanimate, we objectify the in, in, inanimate. And my work is watching, and I want it to go out into the world and watch, and remind people that they're being watched, right? And so as much as there's that emptiness, that breeze from inside, um, my work is also um, navigating uh, another dimension of awareness, or the intention I'm putting out there is to do that. Um, and in that, you know, to, to think about our role in, uh, in how we can be more conscious of, of the way that we see the patterns of our world going back to the beginning. So reincarnation has, we are only a step in this larger picture, whether we're um, the seventh generation of our great, 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 great grandparents, or we are um, the great ancestor of someone to come, how we stay aware of that, right? Um, the picture on the right is of uh, one of the river girls that I put in the water, and the star on her throat is, is taking her voice far, far and wide, her breath, directing it where it needs to go. I've been thinking about our relationship to um, materials and how materials feel, feel have feeling and, and consciousness. And so when I'm dressing up the pieces, and that's the fun part now, <laughs> when I put the necklaces on and they're sitting there and I go, what do you want to wear? <laughs> and then we have this moment where I dress them up. These are, um, on this piece, are large sea urchin sh spikes. And I think that was really cool. There's lava, there's clay, there's steel, there's um, th that one has glass and leather, um, and each of those elements are pieces of us. We are that. It's not separate from us. And I love that, like, the energy that the, um, that the lava holds or the, the, I've been thinking about bone and leather and how it's so close to our own being and that all the things that die for us to be here every single day, plants and animals die for us to go on with our lives and we forget them and we forget that we're taking, taking, taking to make and how do we turn around and remember that we are also a part of this, uh, this cycle. We're not exempt, we're of it. Um, and also like trying to find just the beauty in it. I've been thinking a lot about wood recently and how it fits in my world. Um, and I found these wooden beads and I built a piece around the wood itself, the wooden beads itself. So the material informed the presence that I was trying to build. And maybe those beads called me and said, hey, we need to be honored. Will you do that for us? And I didn't even know, I was just a tool and I did it for them. <laughs> and I like to think that um, there oftentimes there, there are things at work that are beyond what we might think we know. Um, this piece on the left is called Heights, um, and it has that lifting of the mind, lifting of the mind, where we can have a higher thought. So sometimes when I'm grumbling through my day, I always think, um, "What is the better feeling thought I could have right now?" 
So then I go into the studio and I make that so I can see what, what is a better feeling thought, right? And how can I build that trail, that story that, that tracks to a higher uh, way of thinking about this moment because like I, you know, like we were talking about, our, our thoughts are really powerful and if we're more conscious about them, then, then um, we're not victims as much as we think we are, right? Um, and oftentimes I don't include arms in my pieces. And that's because, um, I mean, even though a lot of my work isn't gendered, but everything is me, it's a piece of me. They're all my own truth, my own experience. Um, they have eyes, nose, ears, because they're hearing, they're smelling, they have their senses, and they have feet that are stable and strong, but they're not doing. And it's because my whole life I've been thinking that doing and doing and doing is how I, uh, you know, be a good person. <laughs> that I am only a good person if I, if I do a lot. <laughs> Quite obvious, <laughs> I've been busy. <laughs> but, if, but I'm trying to teach myself that actually being might be more important. And so my work is standing and looking at me in a state of repose and, and uh, reflecting to me a state of being. Um, then the piece on the right has arms, <laughs> and, it's, and it's conjuring. This is from the series called Conjure, where I'm asking for guidance, for higher thought. I don't even know if I can imagine the utopia that's coming. I think my mind and my imagination is so limited. And every time I think I know what's right for people, what's right for the world, what's right, I'm like, ah, oh, there's so much more. There's so much more. And I have to remember that I'm a, I'm a poor thing. <laughs> and, our, and where I come from, we, we call ourselves poor things. And that's a good thing. <laughs> that I'm a poor thing and I don't know. And I have to give it over to something else and say, hey, teach me what I don't know because I know it's gonna be way more brilliant than I could ever know. And if I just watch and listen, then I'll actually learn something rather than thinking I know everything all the time. As I stand here and tell you guys. <laughs> um, one of the biggest things that happened in my life was becoming a mom, a, a parent, an only parent, and that matters. Because I had a colicky baby and she was crying all night long, and there was nobody to hand her to. And I had to stand and shake her and rock her and rock her and rock her past the time I thought I was going to go crazy. My body didn't have anything left, and I kept going. And there was something left, and I kept pushing, and I kept pushing. And it changed me. And, and my idea of what power looked like, what strength looked like was so masculine. And it wasn't about being a parent and how you can nurture. It was about how I could push myself around and run over people and, and not be conscious of other people's needs. And I realized that actually the biggest moment of strength I found was when I really loved someone so much that I would care for them past my point of insanity, <laughs> really. Um, and I didn't realize how much it changed me, actually, until I did this project in Las Vegas, Nevada. <laughs> um, I did this project called Lamb Back Arts, and it was through the Nevada Museum of Art. They have an art and environment conference, and I worked with Fawn Douglas, who's Southern Paiute, and she was on her ancestral homelands in um, Las Vegas, Nevada. And so we got together, and we built our parameters of what that looked like. And we decided that we were going to collaborate on what we would wear. And we would co-create. So all the participants sat and sewed for two weeks. We made our shoes. We made our dresses. We made everything. And we, um, we even screen printed the bandanas. <laughs> and we talked and talked and laughed and shared food. And, um, and then we talked about what this would be, me and Fawn. What does empowerment look like? What does land back look like? How do we inhabit that? How do we show that? How do we demonstrate that fully? And how do I, as a guest in her ancestral homelands, um, help support her community to, to um, actively um, inhabit that 
and feel that. Um, and so I had to sort of put aside, I took a car out there, I drove a car out there, I, I actually trailered it out thinking, we're going to need a car. <laughs> and we were sitting there, I think it was the morning before we did it, and we said, you know what, we're not going to use that car. And we said, we need the number 12, so we're going to take 12 steps, and then we're going to stop for the count of 12, and that's all we're going to do. So we did. We walked slow, and it was quiet, and it was terrifying, and all the sounds were so loud. And we walked down a main street, and we took 12 steps, and we stopped for the count of 12. And the feeling of empowerment was so much stronger than anything I'd ever felt before. Where you have to listen, and you have to kind of let it sink in, the cacophony that colonization has brought to this moment and this place with these people. And it was all women. And there was two moms and two daughters. <laughs> and in that moment, because my little girl did it with us, I realized that there was something about um, matriarchy. And there was something about love. And there was something about power. And there was something about standing in your uh, noble, empowered mother place that is actually incredibly uh, transformational. Um, and to take the vessel, that vessel like Maria Martinez or Ko'ohun's pots and stand there like that vessel sits there and watches and witnesses and is conscious and aware. And what prayers is it making? What is it trying to bring to consciousness by just being, by not doing, but just being? Standing in silence, taking 12 steps and then stopping and listening. Feeling the traffic flow around you, but you're not going to move. That was pretty amazing. <laughs> um, and, it, and it taught me a whole lot. And then the opposite of, of being still is how do you inhabit that space and move. Um, and so I actually made work for dancers. And I got to um, work with them to make them into these vessels of empowerment and what does that look like? Um, so leather and think about how the vessel, the pottery, those patterns when they get animated, what does it look like? How does it empower itself and live in relationship and expression? And each of the uh, performers, the transformers, were from different communities, so I had to work with them um, to create their, uh, their adornment, and then they took it with them to carry with their life and to express themselves. Um, one of my most recent projects um, is Dream House, and it's a, a, a project that I did at the Fabric Workshop and Museum in, Phil in Philadelphia. And um, this last year, I did one solo show, <laughs> and then I was going back and forth to Philadelphia to do this. And I think this is one of the most important pieces I've ever done, in that uh, I worked with the curator, Karen Patterson. And she texted me every day, and she would say, what are you dreaming about? What do you want? What do you really want to do that you don't get to do? And so we made these vessels um, that were, that were um, rooms in the space and you walk through the rooms and you can't go in but you can look in and right when you walk into the space uh, you're confronted by your shadow and I wanted people to be aware of their presence in the space and as they walk through they could look into the rooms but they weren't allowed to go in and that's okay right and these rooms represented um, these these dreams that I have for myself for my growth one is uh, a room with a table and a chair here. You can see the little cup sitting there. And there's three ancestors on the wall where I am sitting in this journey and I'm convening with uh, the ancestors as they help me figure it out, right? And it's not this dream of, of um, you know, the things I thought my dream would be. It's like if you really go there, what is it? It's actually, I would, I would love to have a conversation and to be aware of the support that I have in this journey, right? Or it's a kitchen where I feel nourished 
and I have um, these bowls and pots that, that uh, feel really good to me. And it's not full of plastic and junk. It's, it's, um, it feels really clean and pure uh, for my journey that I'm going on. Um, and I worked with the clay studio in Philadelphia to make the faces, the, the masks that hang on the wall, and the pots. The last room, we invited people in. You take off your shoes, you sit on a, on a, a pillow, and there's this long cherry table, and there's cards. And you can ask questions and see if you get some answers. And above you are the stars and all these paper bowls <laughs> that remind you that we're being guided all the time, reminding me. And that was that moment I invite people in so we can have this community moment where we co-create and we co-ask and we co-visualize what could be. This is a detail. <laughs> so, provenance, provenance. <laughs> um, again, accountability to return, to go in circles, to understand, um, and to remember where we come from and that we are creating that story. Uh, it's the bones that hold us all together. It's the story. It's what we say that builds our reality. Whether it's a cage or whether it's a monkey bars or whether it's support, what we say and what we believe creates our reality. This, um, the piece on the right is based on, is uh, my take on our traditional uh, uh, Pueblo storytellers, which mostly came from Cochiti. <laughs> Um, and the idea that, that we are creating the world for our um, descendants and the, and the community that comes. And we'd be careful and question it sometimes. Um, the piece on the left is um, at the Denver Art Museum. And again, going back to what is empowerment look like, is that nurturing or is that an attack, right? Or is that a confrontation? Sometimes the nurturing might be uh, the actual um, tool for empowerment. Um, and, as a, and as a parent, a lot, you know, becoming a parent, becoming a parent has made me really see how I am only a step in this process, right? I used to be like, yeah, let's burn it all to the ground. I'm like, whoa, 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 wait, no more. To, hold on, I don't want it to all crash and burn yet. I have somebody that I want to have a beautiful, wonderful life, right? And so now I feel really, really, really responsible for um, creating that to be something beautiful for her. So this piece is holding you know, my child up, and they have this new perspective that I can't ever know. They see all the sides. We're in relationship. I started making pieces that were doubles. And um, that when they were built together, they had this relationship, they had community, they were, they were, you know, maybe it's yourself, the way you view yourself, maybe it's a sibling, maybe it's a partner, maybe it's a child, maybe it's, um, you know, a best friend. And when they go out into the world, they don't necessarily stay together, but that line is always, there's tension between them. They're always continuing the story with each other. And also with the car, I did this print where I drew the car um, at Tamarind. And you can put them both ways, so they're driving away from each other, or they're nose to nose, or you could, you know, install them different ways. And I felt I really wanted to give people that curatorial advantage where you start looking at how things are in relationship to each other. And um, this piece on the left, Genesis 1, was the first piece I made when I made, I, when I made my kid. <laughs> and uh, I just wrapped her to me and I went back to work, you know. And that was the first piece I made in the studio. And I think it was um, a really transformative piece because it was the first time that I slowed down and I realized that my time was like, all of a sudden you have a kid and you don't have all the time. You can't just dawdle around in the studio and mess around. You got to get it done, right? So there's this like, all of a sudden there was, uh, it got serious, it got real, you know? And this process and my intention, it wasn't messing around anymore. I had to get really serious and um, figure out what I was trying to say and say it, right? <laughs> get it done because the kid was taking off with something sharp. <laughs> So you just got to, you know, uh, um, be very direct and clear with what you're thinking about. And I think that it's transformed my process so much. Um, reclamation 4 is um, uh, in the 
most recent show I opened, I have a solo show in New York at Jack Shaman Gallery of, of all the studio work from last year. And a lot of it is, is about how we question the narratives and the roads that we begin, be, we've been given. The, the show is called Road Less Traveled. And I've been thinking about how I can build a piece that looks back at me and challenges the things I think and asks me, is there another way? You have this, this super highway of a neural pathway of thinking, and can you uh, figure out another way of doing things, of thinking, a, a new way of believing uh, how the whole thing works? Because if we do that, then we're back in a state of wonder. Because as long as we're thinking we know everything, we've lost our wonder. And I know this. I'm doing it because I need it. <laughs> because I'm a mom, and I say, don't do that. You can't do that. Sit down. Go over here. <laughs> right? Um, because I navigate the world often from a state of fear, and I'm trying to remember how to do it from a state of wonder. And the piece on the right is called Release, and it was supposed to be this tall. And my, I was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to make this cute little piece, and it's about letting go, right, and letting go of all the things, letting go, letting go of who is Rose, letting go of identity, letting go of gender, letting go of culture, letting go of all of it, and just emptying, listen, and then it'll come back and teach me something new. Uh, ended up being seven feet tall. <laughs> so I guess it was like really serious. Like I really need to learn that one. I was like, okay, geez, I, I hear you. Um, this is the last piece I'm gonna show you. Um, and this one is Remind. And um, it's like that tall probably, um, and it has all these steel plates that are welded, um, and they're stars, and the piece is covered in stars um, and, and protection, and it's reminding that, that I'm of something bigger. We're of something bigger, and we forget. We get real small. Even in this big room, we get real small, and we, by thinking, we, we know by thinking, we know, we limit what's possible. We just keep limiting and limiting and limiting and limiting ourselves until we're so small. And if we look up and observe the contextual field, it is so small. And then we'll remember we're part of something vast. And if we listen and we watch and we witness and we take a minute and remember we're guests and we're also that being a guest is the way to be no matter if we're home, that we are a guest in our body, we're a guest in all things, and it deserves to be treated with that type of respect. And in that place of wonder where we're always uh, acknowledging and respecting where we go, that we can be taught things that we could never imagine. And that's where I want to go. And that's why I'm making this work, because this is what I need to learn, and this is what I'm excited about. And I hope by making it that uh, other people can find a path to that inside themselves as well. Thank you. My goodness. I actually need, I need a few minutes because that was probably one of the best presentations. I, I got to see Ms. Simpson's work in Boston, one of my professors says, oh, you gotta go see your work in person. And I looked at that work and I'm like, how dare she? How dare she speak so much to my heart? How dare she talk about my womanhood, my Africanness 
in her work as well. And so it's been, it's such a pleasure. And I, and I think I'm gonna have this pleasure a lot in Nsika of connecting, making these connections with how we are with clay and what it gives to us. It is like, I've been working in clay for a long time and it is always giving, giving to me. And it's something that, you know, for so many of us who are ceramic teachers, it is like the biggest gift that we can give, you know, to, to the next generation. And it's like so amazing to see every generation back and forward take this material and make magic and tell stories and remind us of who we are and, and what we want and what we can be. So I hope your experience here at Nsika will give to you so that we can give back and have this circle just keep rolling and rolling and rolling because this is, this is our magic. You know, this material, our communion with each other, this is what Nsika is here to share. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you for, so, for your wonderfully amazing presentation. We hope you take the time to connect with each other, to be inspired to create community, to be inspired to release yourself from anything that keeps you from being the magical person that you are meant to be. So again, thank you again for sharing your time with us. You could have been anywhere, but you're here with us. And as I see so many people who are experiencing Nsika for the first time, I am so happy you're here. <laughs> so thank you again, and have a wonderful time in Nsika. Um, I'm actually going to bring Pam back up. Not yet. Not yet? We just want to make sure everybody stays for an amazing Randall session. Oh, yes, that's I right. Know. We I, know. <laughs> I know you were also Clem. You know? I am completely. Um, so we have the Randall session coming. Yes, we do. And um, please stay tuned. We're going, to take a, we're going to take a break and then come back. Come back and join us for more. One billion years ago, the future site of Cincinnati sat along the coast of what later became the proto-North American continent. Ceramic artists like Maria Long Restore, who established Rookwood pottery when she found that clays in the Ohio Valley rivaled those used in the world's finest ceramics. Those are just some of the reasons why the National Council on Education for the Ceramic Arts pick Cincinnati for their next conference location with the theme of current, slated from March 15th through the 18th of 2023. Rookwood is uniquely positioned as a pottery within the country in terms of the scope of what we do. We've gone through many evolutions over 140 years of our history, and so when something shifts from a very traditional, bucolic, pastoral type of hand-painted scenery, to more arts and crafts, art deco. Very often it's the artists that, that fuel that design change. Today we have even more artists, more hands getting dirty and shaping our world. And we have institutions that support those makers, like our world-class museums with encyclopedic collections and art schools employing top-notch artists from around the world, 
right in our own backyard. I love the boundless directions for expression that you can find in ceramics. I think, and ceramics last forever, so there's always a history there to be told or um, that will continue on into the future. From the actual materials underneath us to the peoples who walk this land, connect us to clay. It is what has formed us as a community. Uh, I think what makes the clay community special is that we all have that common passion of creating something from absolutely nothing. The rawest of materials become this magical form uh, from all the art centers and art studios. I mean, Cincinnati is really happening for a smaller river town. Clay is the vehicle by which we make real the material of our imaginations. Most students have access to painting and drawing in their early learning stages, but they don't uh, usually have the opportunity to work with uh, three-dimensional. With the pandemic, people tend to show more appreciation for having handmade objects and art in their environment. On the other hand, there are more diverse ideas and diverse groups of people coming in, and people are experimenting with interdisciplinary approaches in ceramics or over the place. And it is the connective tissue which can also hold us together as a community. Our clay, our history, our community of makers, all of us getting our hands dirty in the attempt to shape the materials of our lives into something more beautiful, more meaningful. Welcome everybody, come on, join us. We hope to see you there. NSICA 2023, Cincinnati. Um, after a very quick break, please take your seats because we are so excited for the Randall session, which is starting momentarily. Um, and I really want to send a huge shout out to ArtsWave for funding the Randall session this evening. There is a handout in your Inseca bags to tell you all about ArtsWave, the biggest funder of the arts in Cincinnati. So please read up on this amazing organization. And Pam, would you like My to turn. introduce? I would. <laughs> um, again, hi and welcome. And we're so glad you're here. And I guess you can tell this is a city that elected officials really believe in the arts. They support us. They acknowledge us, they celebrate us, they elevate us. And you saw that with our mayor earlier. And I would love to introduce you to Reggie Harris. And I'm gonna read this so that I don't miss any of the magic that Reggie Harris is. Reggie is one of our most favorite council persons. And he is a Cincinnati council member, chairing the budget and finance committee and vice chairing the equality Oh, equitable Growth and Housing Committee, a professional ballet dancer. He's my teacher also with Dance Fix. With 10 years of performing experience, he danced with the Joffrey Ballet of Chicago. And Reggie spent years and years working in Chicago for uh, first public performing arts high school, developing and teaching aspiring young dancers. As a clinical social worker and nonprofit leader, Reggie has worked in affordable housing, development, LGBTQ plus homelessness, housing case management, and behavioral health therapy. Reggie received his undergraduate degree um, from the Roosevelt University and his Master of Social Work from the Boston University. Please welcome Reggie Harris, Councilman from Cincinnati, to the stage. I'm gonna take this. All right, Nsika, hello. Are you with me? Woo! 
It is just a pleasure to have you here in Cincinnati. So I have to say that I did um, a happy hour at the Orchid at Palm Court at the Netherland, and I feel like I saw a lot of folks in this audience there, and it just warmed my heart. A uh, welcome back to Cincinnati. I know that our mayor, Aftab Piraval, greeted you, and I just want you to know, um, this work, the work of being an artist, the work of passing on the tradition of art and art making is really at the root of, of Cincinnati's history. And we could not be more excited to host you. Um, as Pam said, my background is as a professional dancer. Um, I am born and bred of an artistic practice, the discipline that it inspires, excuse me, the discipline that it inspires uh, and the passion that really drives how I show up in the world. And so uh, I was really struck by this idea in listening to our keynote uh, and listening to Mapo about this idea of mutual transformation. And I'm not a potter, I'm not a ceramicist, but I can imagine that when you put your hands on clay for the first time, there's something that feels familiar, yes, but there's something that's new about every time. No? There is this idea of mutual transformation. You both transform the material in which you work with, and you are also transformed by working with that material. And it is my hope that as an elected leader that I can bring that concept to our work of mutual transformation, that I am both able to transform our city but be transformed by the people that live in our city and they come to visit and play. So welcome and thank you for being here and enjoy the Queen City. Now with that, I have to bring you into the Randall session. And boy, are you getting ready to rock out. Rock out not only to the just the, the rhythm and the expression, but to the beautiful folks that are on this stage. And so please tune in get comfy, let's do a collective inhale. <sighs> Sit back, let all of our senses be taken in by the Randall session, enjoy. The sense of time, the sense of time, the sense of time, time, the sense of time, the sense of time, time, the sense of time, the sense of time, time, the sense of time, the sense of The sense of time, time, the sense 
I wanted to speak. Uh, uh, I wanted to. I wanted to shape a space to hold a peace, a joy of love, a calm at least. So I took my position at the wheel to roll my dream into a thing for real. As soon as I'm sitting, the world starts spinning and bringing in the question every one of my intentions. And I really do something with the stuff I'm touching. What if all of this spinning really leads to nothing? While I was still thinking, the substance pulled me in, soothing my soul with every spin. I really couldn't say if the world was still turning, but all of this killing and cheating and burning continued as it had before I sat at the wheel while touching the clay of the power to heal there was nothing there yet there was nothing there yet i was pushing with my right pulling with my left flexing my thumbs holding my breath not seeing that the clay was taking my stress yo i was shaking no less so much determination to shake the place of rest but just one quest can i really pull a vessel out of all of this mess you're yes doing all those things and the focus that you have to have and you're the being present in your body yeah, that, that's probably the at-the-wheel feeling that I have. I just thought time disappeared. I think that was the thing that is the most amazing. Additive and subtractive, and it shows every touch of the hand. So everything that you do, you leave a mark that's very personal and it's very of the moment. Hello? Hey, Dawn. Got something heavy to ask you. Yo, I got you. What you need me to do? I got this assignment, but the question I find is how to cover in lines while telling my truth. My brother, you have been called to a task that seems a heavy ask, but your tools of artistry and all of their authenticity will rise to the occasion. For words are formed just like clay, just like the dancer's sway, like the sculptor's hand shape, like the instrument resonates. It's the organic copulation of truth and expression and a thirst for elevation. The inspiration will abound where they all meet. It's the intimacy of two seemingly different entities, finding a common place to breathe, to touch, to see, to be taught what it means to be at peace, to be released from molded realities, the creative must be free. To step to the edge of uncertainty where existence is solely based on the courage to embrace the belief that freedom requires a transformative mind state. We strive to reshape the world for goodness' sake, palatable for every walk of the human race. We were taught to survive, then adapt, then thrive. But artistry informs us that we can rewrite the lies, reform our lives into greatness uncompromised against the tide. So we ground our souls in soil where the fruits of our labor can grow. In earth that we mold, all art forms are what they are in their own autonomy and simultaneously what each of them needs the other to be. So be so inclined to engage the use of pen and page. The exchange will be power powerfully climatic for all artistry is inherently attracted to its reflection. Impacted by the promise of conception, the direction is clear when we exist without borders, rearranging and deconstructing tightly held order. We harness what is innate to emancipate the cage, allowing beauty in its rarest form to take shape without time disrupting the kinetic space, leaving no trace of meter distress and impatient doubt. What is confined within will be willed to find its way out. An artist's duty, as far as I'm concerned, is to reflect the times. I think that is true of, of, of painters, sculptors, poets, musicians. I, it's as far as I'm concerned, it's their choice. But I choose to reflect the times and the situations in which I find myself. That, to me, is my duty. I, and, and, and at this crucial time in our lives, when everything is so desperate, when every day is a matter of survival, I don't think you can help but be involved. Young people, black and white, know this. That's why they're so involved in politics. We will shape and mold this country, or it will not be molded and shaped at all anymore. So I don't think you have a choice. How can you be an artist and not reflect the times? That, to me, is the definition of an artist.
right to burn the stories of the silence on my tongue and speak for the ones whose voices have gone unheard. Hear the chant of freedom in their reverberation. They become an insurmountable nation, structured from nouns and verbs. I extend, go all in, full acceleration to end the perpetuation of mental starvation. It is my duty as an artist and expectation. If you don't acknowledge the significance of the roots, then you will never harvest the fruit. Your tribe will not be able to re recognize you without something to connect to. Liberation and self-actualization define purpose for living, but when the fan thinks it controls the wind, consciousness cannot ascend. So when I scribe, I won't stretch truths to inject lies. Pull the wool from sleeping eyes for better sight. All right. The moment you come out of a ball of clay on the wheel, Mm -hmm. It's exceptional. It's exceptional. Mm -hmm. And then on, and the, then wheel, on the wheel, wheel, you are taught you are taught patience. 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 So on the wheel you cannot do no, you have to you have to let the clay adjust to your command. Mm. But you, you have to do it gracefully. Mm. You have to do it patiently. Mm. You can you can force the clay to just for something to spring out of it just like that. neighborhood, in your family, in yourself, trying to deal with what ills you might find over time. One thing is true, you never really know if you're molding the situation or if the situation is molding you. And try to skip some steps along the road All the sweat I gave this work just might explode oh, oh. Now who is molding who? The wheel keeps turning around Who is molding who? As the pot comes out Now who is molding who? The wheel keeps turning Yeah, who is molding who? The pot comes out. We stand in full transparency uh, of who we are. And all of our beauty and uh, all of our scars. Seeking not to go uh, fast, but to go far. Guided by a single iridescent star. If I am certain of nothing, I know that this energy is in charge. The vibration starts in the heart and extends itself until it and we are one part of the greater human experience. Mindful interference that seeks to divide, that tries to deny. Birthright informs me that the worth of our lives has been solidified by something greater than we can ascertain. And I realize that everything I touch, I change. And everything I change, changes me. Within that six degrees, I'm gonna be free to create a vision complementary to legacy. How could I not be changed knowing what I know to be true? The question is, who am I changing into? And what will become of the change I produce? Who's molding who? If the only eyes we see through are those that are conditioned to refuse humanity's point of view. 
to be a very patient process. When I became a father, whatever my son does, I kind of, before I even do anything, I reflect on myself, on the wheel, what I would do to say, if I'm to throw a part.
I was going to be And then I just replicate that with my children. So I would say clay on the wheel especially, and then to large extent, everything about clay taught me patience that I was able to replicate with my kids. Mm -hmm. Between my in, in, in relationship between in, in, in relationship between myself, the subject and the object, so I'm holding the vessel. Mm -hmm. the, the thing is, this is my relationship with the vessel, right? My body is ephemeral, the vessel stays so it's coming from the vessel. And no, it's going to be inside. The sound is coming from the vessel, but you don't know where it's coming from. If, if you change it, change the word, we're all willing for that change, right? In, in relationship between myself, the subject, and the object. So I'm holding the vessel. Mm. The, the thing is, this is my relationship with the vessel, right? My body is ephemeral, the vessel stays so it's coming from the vessel. And no, it's going to be inside. The sound is coming from the vessel, but you don't know where it's coming from. If, if you change it, change the word, we're all willing for that change, right? And I feel like it's it's just so beautiful because we I, I feel we are in a moment that we all our, our generation is trying to do a generation of artists artists and intellectuals they're they're doing something to, to be able to change future narrative right uh, we all part of different diasporas and we want to contribute. Uh, to the story of our ancestor, to stories of past, and then what we are doing. I feel like this is what exactly I'm trying to do through this performance, that what is my goal and what, I'm, what am I holding onto this vessel to pass it to the next generation. When I'm gone, the vessel remains, the story within that uh, vessel remains for the, for the future. really good to be here. Great, no, better than good. It's great, it's a blessing to be here tonight. And to be a part of this amazing event and to be, to have the opportunity to have met and worked with the incredible, more than artist, um, I don't, I, I can't, well, ceramicist in many different ways. The voice that you just heard was that of uh, this is from the book of uh, Fannin and others at the wheel. And this particular voice that you just heard was a passage from Rahelia Philosophy. Rahelia Philosophy. Could you put your hands together for Rahelia Philosophy, please? The very first voice that you heard were the, the fir first two voices that you heard were the voices of Jeff, Asidu, Kwartang. Can you put your hands together for him, please? He was the first person that I had the honor of speaking to to develop the, the ideas that would become this project. And we spent a lot of time together talking about patience and fatherhood and the metaphor of, of social change and revolution and how you have to be, you have to be centered. You have to have the, the objects centered. The clay has to be centered on the wheel before you can open it up. If you open it up and it's not centered, the opening won't be centered. And then you gotta work the bubbles out and you gotta do all of this work. You have to be patient with the process. So JFF was really inspiring to speak with. And then the next voice that you heard Near, at the beginning was the voice of the amazing Beth Lowe. We had a great time talking together, talking about music. And time, 
time. You're also going to hear later the voices of uh, Marissa Childers. And the influences and wisdom of Paul Andrew Wanless. And before I share some passages from this great book, Fannin and others at the will. Are you all familiar with Franz Fannin? Some of you maybe. Well, before, before I read some of that, I want to familiarize you with my beautiful family, comrades, and peers here. On poetry, spoken word, we have Don Crooks. Don Crooks. On many beautiful instruments, flute, different kinds of flute, clay flute, and clay marimba, and udu. Udu, thank you. I was calling it something wrong as we were preparing for this. It was like, what are you talking about? It's like, at that thing. It's like, oh, the Udu. Johnny Rusha. <laughs> On saxophones, Dan Barger. <laughs> On electric bass and production, Brent Olds. Our beautiful dancers are Camille Jones and Anaya Nicole. And on the groove, Isaiah Cook. book, this pot, this pan, this plate, this bowl, this vessel, this moment is a clinical study. It's a clinical study. Those who recognize themselves in it will, I believe, have made a step in the right direction. My true wish is to get my sister, my brother, black, white, brown, yellow, burnt, orange, clay, gray, uh, off-white, any my brother and my sister, to shake off the dust of the l lamentable livery built up over centuries of incomprehension. The structure, the structure, you see the structure of this present work is grounded in temporality. Every human cries out, every human problem cries out, every human cries out, every human problem cries out to be considered on the basis of time. The ideal being that the present always serves to build the future. And this future, this, this, this future right here, this future is not that of the cosmos, but very much the future of my century, of my country, my existence, in no way is it up to me to prepare for the world coming after me. I am resolutely a man. 
man of my time. And that is my reason for living. The future must be a construction supported by a human in the present. This future edifice is linked to the present in so far much as, in so far much as, I consider the present to be something that must be overtaken. These words, like hands in need of solace and refuge. Too often refuse connections that the heart can use. Come stretch forth to the will. Knowing that much like my pen, it too will, re will reveal age old stories etched into each crease of my palm. Narrated in a psalm, I receive a calm. The steadiness of the spin invites a tranquil mood. Wellness is and have never been a task easily accomplished without tools. The space, sacred, meditative, until I am moved to create an alternate re reality from the one that seems to rally around untruths. I choose to lose myself in the turn of the wheel. I don't think, I don't speak, I only feel. No expectations to meet, no perceptions to appease, no doses of approval curating my identity, just exploration of my spirit's intangible needs. I can't be real in a shell made of plastic, in a world with an eroding social fabric and beings living inside of a screen. I sit at the wheel and feel seen. I become whole where halves are the norm. I am mended where I have been torn. The thickness of the mud slips through fingers unrestrained, but patiently controlled all the same as self-realization is framed into a depiction I can actually name. Creativity is inevitably a result of energy and all of its entities, and it is at the will that I find me. So everything that I make um, is primarily functional. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm pulling from a lot of different things when I'm making my work. So it's all revolving around connection and how that um, how that is personal for me in my life. And then hopefully that kind of transitions into other people in their life. To see how it all comes full circle when you start pulling in all these different inspirations. Like looking oh, back, yeah. like at my grandmother, my great grandmother, even my mom, like how artistic they were in their own way. They did a lot of quilting and sewing and gardening and there's, you know, baking and all these different things that like still have this artistic nature, but I feel like weren't really recognized um, as being artistic. It was just, you know, this like role of a woman within a domestic space, like that was what you were supposed to do. Um, so I take a lot of that and still allow that to inform the work that I'm doing now. So, so some of the artists that like I really look up to, um, Julia Galloway being a really big one, um, I absolutely admire the work that she's done and the amount of practice that she's put into her process and just informing um, everyone within the ceramics, um, within the ceramic world. Um, but some other people that I'm, I'm really interested in looking at is like Melanie Sherman and Deb Swipskoff. Just like their their process and how elegant their pieces uh, look and then the way that they like approach their process. I just feel like that's something that's very unique and I feel like they're like giving women like a really good representation within ceramics. And I feel like they're like giving women like a really good reference, how elegant their pieces uh, look and then the way that they like approach their process. I just feel like that's something that's very unique. And I feel like they're like giving women like a really good representation within ceramics.
Okay. Well, this gives me enough time to say that I was a little concerned earlier when there was so, so many people in the room. But right now, this is the proper amount. In, in the, this is the proper amount in the Duke Energy Convention Center for us to condone full room dancing. Full room. And the groove is correct. I do believe the groove is correct. And we have plants in the room. We have some people to, some ringers. Uh huh. That's it. Get him, Don, get him. Get him. Her hands crafted 10 course meals from scraps that were never meant to sustain. Toiled fields of cotton and sugar cane. Picked fruit ripe from California rain. Sold party dresses from tattered rags. Stitched the fabric of the flags we pledge allegiance to. Where no harvest ever grew, she produced an abundance fit to feed kings. Vision so vivid she could dream your imaginings into being. She painted beauty from her pain, created laughter from shame. Humbly brilliant and resilient beyond measure, she produced treasures, priceless, but desired for her worth. Everything she birthed nourishes the earth. She made magic. She made peace. She made love. She made me. She made queen. She is artistry. Yes. Dawn Crooks. done and I looked at what was under this ever burning sun and it, the, the problems was stressing me, stressing me out and I didn't know what to do about it but I just said to myself, okay, I'm gonna do something about it. I'm gonna definitely do something. I gotta do something about it because I'm a man of my time and I said, I, I, I said, look, I wanted to shape a space to hold a piece of joy, of love, or calm at least. So I took my position at the wheel to mold my dreams, to mold our dreams into a thing for real. And as soon as I'm sitting, the world starts spinning and bringing into question every one of my intentions. I was like, oh man, can I really do something with this stuff I'm touching? What if all of this spinning really leads to nothing? While I was still thinking, the substance pulled me in was soothing my soul with every spin. Now, I couldn't really tell you if the world was still turning, but all the same cheating and killing and burning continued as it had before I sat at the wheel. But somehow with touching the clay, I felt the power to heal. Yet there was nothing there yet. There was nothing there yet. I was pushing with my right and pulling with my left and flexing my thumbs and <laughs> holding my breath. Not seeing that the clay was taking my stress. 
so much determination to make a place of rest well, but still there just remains one quest can we really pull a vessel out of all of this mess Don Wisdom Crooks, Johnny Rusha, Dan Barger, Brent Olds, Isaiah Crooks, Anaya Nicole, Camille Jones. My name is Napoleon Maddox, and it has been a pleasure to spend the evening with you. Thank you very much, and welcome to Cincinnati. safe trip back to where you're coming from and we will see you bright and early in the morning for all the fabulous and wonderful presentations and talks so thank you so much for joining us hope you had a great time good night